Hello and welcome to Stuff That Interests Me with me, Dominic Frisby. And my guest today is an economist, he's a journalist, he's a broadcaster, he is Liam Halligan. And he, together with the economist Gerard Lyons, has written a new book, Clean Brexit. And the subtitle of the book is How to Make a Success of Leaving the European Union. Now, I read this book, Liam, and as much as it was much as it, as it seemed to be about um, entertaining and informing, it was also seen to be written as a kind of, this is how you have to do it, almost as a kind of policy document in a kind of way. So I guess my first question is, is why did you write the book? We wrote the book because we're both practical economists who follow politics closely and have many contacts across uh, the political spectrum. And we feel this debate is being conducted it's almost a fact-free zone. It's become about trading slogans rather than conducted with any real knowledge of what a trade deal is and what the single market is and what the customs union is. So the first half of the book, Dominic, there are 50 bullet points in the first half. It's a practical guide. To 25 in the first half, 25 in the second half. So, yeah. the first, the, so the first half of the book, there's a, a, it's a practical guide. There are 25 bullet points to how you actually negotiate on behalf of the UK during the Article 50 process. And then the second half of the book is the kind of economy that Gerard and I want to see uh, after Brexit, partly using policies that we can only really implement once we've left the EU. I, I notice it's kind of, in leaving the EU, it's the opportunity to kind of That's for right. a new start. I don't see Brexit as sackcloth and ashes. This is something that we must do because the people have voted. I voted for, for Brexit after a lot of thought. Um, you've known me for many years. Uh, I only came to the conclusion that I definitely wanted to leave. You were the a late Brexiter. Well, I only came. To, I've always been against the UK joining the euro, and in the late 90s, I took huge opprobrium from many of my uh, media elite friends for saying the UK should never join the euro. That apparently made me, you know, racist and stupid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I only came to leaving the EU after Cameron went to Europe yeah. and tried to renegotiate. And his renegotiation was, frankly, risible. He told the EU what the outcome of his vote was going to be before he'd done the renegotiation. And Europe, the EU itself, showed it had a complete tin ear. There was no way it was going to reform in any way possible. That, and that for me, that was the breaking point. That was the moment when I thought, OK, I do want to leave the European Union on balance uh, and I want to make sure that it's done properly. That renegotiation of Cameron's was the point at which he should have changed his stance towards the EU. Absolutely. And it showed, I think, just how unreformable the EU is. You know, there's a lot of history in clean Brexit, as well as a practical guide to negotiation. Uh, the EU obviously started with fantastic intentions in 1957 from the ashes of the Second World War. You know, a war-ravaged continent. Uh, Britain wasn't a member of the treaty uh, uh, originally signing the Treaty of Rome in '57, we were latecomers. But I also think when we joined in 1973, uh, and then we had a post-joining referendum, of course, in 1975, which you and me sort of remember as, as, as kids. Just. Um, uh, I think, again, intentions were largely good. But even then, there was a murmur of the fact that this is a real dilution of sovereignty. Uh, and since then, of course, the, the drawing away of power from our own elected politicians in the UK towards largely unelected people uh, elsewhere uh, has become uh, far, far more intense. And for me, a lot of the reason I wanted to leave the EU is on that sovereignty basis. Yeah. Um, you kept saying the word intentions there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I voted leave, but I expect most, most people who voted remain and probably most people who work for the EU or su who support the EU believe their intentions are good. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean they're right. That's I think, right. Was it, was it Milton Friedman? Somebody said the road to hell is paved with good intention. It was Shakespeare, actually. <laughs> Even better. Though, though Friedman probably uh, pick, picked it up as well. Yeah. Uh, no, th this, this has become a very venal debate, and the referendum seems to have been the beginning of the division rather uh, uh, than the end. And that's another reason that Jared and I wrote the book, because we are... You know, I, guess, I, I hope our reputation is as broadly you know, moderate people. OK, so 
Jared's worked in the past for um, Boris Johnson. He was his chief economic advisor when Boris Johnson was London mayor. But no one would describe Jared, and certainly not me, I hope, as a sort of party political tribal people. We, we, we have friends right across the political spectrum, and most of our friends, frankly, are from outside of politics. We wanted to write a book that said, you know, it is OK, and it, there is a very, very respectable economic case for wanting to be outside the European Union. Uh, and actually, the more you look at it, the more, the more you look at the single market and the customs union, I'm sure we can come on to this, the more you realise that actually there's a lot about them that's really bad for the UK economy. We seem to have got ourselves into a situation where the political narrative is where people call leaving the single market and the customs union hard Brexit, as if you're some kind of nutter uh, and you're ideological and you're willing to sacrifice economic pain as long as you get your mm. own way. Hard Brexit is a complete misnomer. There are many good reasons to be outside the single market. Uh, there are many good reasons to be outside the customs union. I actually think, this may sound, sound like heresy, I actually think once we get un outside the original, the initial uncertainties uh, and the transition period, being outside the European Union, trading more with the fast-growing nations, populous emerging markets and all the rest of it across the world, um, freeing up some of our smaller firms that don't export from the strictures of the European Union, because of course all our firms have to adhere to EU regulations, not a you know, race to the bottom in terms of regulation, but a smarter regulation. I actually think that we could grow faster outside the European Union than we would have had we stayed in. Now, you're a very economically literate guy, I know, and viewers will instantly understand that you can never really know because you can never yeah. prove the counterfactual. But why do we always assume that leaving the European Union is a net economic negative? Why? Because of Project Fear. Because the Treasury, the whole machinery of government told us there will be an immediate and profound economic shock when you even vote to leave the European Union, let alone actually leaving it. We need to open our minds to the fact that most of the successful economies in the world are outside the European Union. We need to open our minds to the fact that the US and the EU, China and the EU, have very, very successful trading relationships. And I don't see the EU telling the US or China that they owe them 10 billion quid a year. I don't see the US or EU being told, uh, the US and China being told by the EU that the EU must dictate its immigration policy or de decide a huge swathe of its laws. If you are like Jerry and I, we're both emerging market specialists. We spent a lot of our career outside of journalism and writing and talking for a living, doing business, um, particularly across the emerging markets. Uh, you realise it's very evident to you that the EU is, is less than 20% of global GDP now. It'll be nearer 15% when we leave. Uh, there's a whole wide world out there that we need to be trading with far, far more because that's where the growth is in future generations. That's where the growth is now. The EU is an increasingly small part of the global economy. We already, Dominic, do more than half our trade outside the EU. The EU isn't our biggest trading partner. The rest of the world is our biggest mm -hmm. trading partner. Um, and that EU non-EU trade that we do is uh, where we generate a surplus on our trade. It's the majority of our trade, as I've said. It's also the fastest growing part of our trade. And that trend will continue. Um, the question that springs to mind there and the argument that, will, that, that, that people will make mistakenly, in my view, is that somehow as a result of leaving the EU, even though we may well trade more with the rest of the world, there's this idea that we will trade less with Europe. I, I think that's mistaken. I think it's mistaken too. There's no need for us to trade any less. There's no need for us to trade any less uh, with, with, with Europe. Um, look, most trade in the world happens outside of free trade agreements. Yeah, The EU and the US don't have a trade we deal. We don't have a trade agreement with the US. We, do we don't have a trade deal with the US. And this, it, that is our single, outside of the EU, that is, the US is our single biggest trading partner, is that right? The, the US is our, the single biggest country, the biggest single country with which we trade. Mm. Uh, we don't have a trade deal with the US. We don't have a trade deal with China. China and the EU don't have a trade deal. The EU and America don't have a trade deal. America and China don't have a trade deal. I don't deal. understand Most the Most trade in the world goes on, Dominic, outside of free trade agreements but if, under WTO rules. If yeah. I want to buy something from you or you want to buy something from me, 
I don't. I still don't understand why I need the approval of a body you in Brussels. You don't. You don't. This is complete nonsense. That doesn't mean that it hasn't propagated the body politic of the United Kingdom. It is absolute nonsense that we need a free trade deal with the EU to trade with the EU. Though, you know, if you listen to Nick Clegg and co, the, the world is going to end if we don't get a free trade deal, which means we have to give them 60 billion quid to well, propagate their, 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 their administration. Of course, a free trade deal is better than using WTO rules. WTO rules, you have um, mutually recognised pretty low tariffs the average tariff is something between 2 and 3% uh, under WTO rules. Some goods it's higher, some goods it's lower. Um, uh, if you cut a free trade agreement with a country, then you can have lower tariffs, otherwise you have to charge the whole of the world uh, WTO tariffs on those particular goods and services. But that doesn't mean that if you don't have a free trade deal, you won't trade with them. Of course you will trade with them. Of course you will trade with them. And we now have to prepare the main sort of negotiating principle that we talk about in clean Brexit, as well as saying, stay at the very beginning, you're going to be outside the single market. Stay at the very beginning, you're going to be outside the customs union. The most important, and we've said that, Theresa May has said that repeatedly in the Lancaster House speech, the Article 50 letter, all the rest of it. The most important thing you then have to do is prepare to trade under WTO rules. Because if you don't prepare to trade under WTO rules uh, and you think you can't and your media and political elite think it's a disaster and you, you haven't done the administrative arrangements you need to prepare for it, then the EU at the last minute will be able to foist a free trade agreement upon you that you'll have to accept that will last forever. It's better in my view to trade under WTO's, WTO rules for a while and then once you've got that as a platform and March 2019 is over and we've done Brexit and everyone's calmed down, then in an orderly adult fashion, you can cut a free trade agreement. Is there somewhere like a, a pithily written summary of what WTO rules and tariffs actually it's are? Chapter, chapter six of my book. <laughs> OK. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. We, I understand and Jared Lyons absolutely understands that there is this vast gulf between... You know, political commentators and, frankly, people who talk a lot on the telly uh, and the, re the, re the technical realities of trade deals and what the single market actually is and what the customs union actually is. And what we've tried to do in this book is bridge that gap as two sort of media literate people who are also economists. We tried to bridge that gap because the vast majority of the economics profession is sort of signed up to Project Fear, either because they're being paid to or they don't want to tell their friends any different. Um, we are two economists who are looking at this. You know, no one's paid us to write clean Brexit. We've, we've, we're just two guys with, with, with modems and, and yeah. laptops. We've written it because we think there's a huge gap in the policy debate and the public needs to be able to read people uh, who can write very, very clearly and succinctly about these complex issues so they can judge for themselves how these negotiations are going and what the UK should do. So as a result of reading your book, I'm mm. going to be able to win every Brexit argument at a dinner table henceforward. Unless I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the biggest, well, one of the biggest hurdles is this, this demon within, this kind of refusal to accept the vote. Yeah. Uh, from Tony Blair downwards and, you know, this idea that we have to have another referendum. And, and there, there is a lot of people who, A, won't accept it and, B, seem to want it to fail in order to prove that they were right rather than accept where we are and try and move forward in the best possible way. How, how do we get rid of that demon? Yeah, there's a lot of people, again, who get airtime <laughs> on the television and write newspaper columns, but that doesn't mean there's a lot of people. Uh, it, the polls consistently show that 70% upward of the public, including those that voted Remain, actually think we should just get on with it now. Yeah. Um, so there are many problems with the idea of having a second referendum. Of course, the EU has a huge amount of form in, in pushing if a vote goes the wrong way, as it did in Ireland twice, as it did in France, as it did in Denmark, Greece, uh, various other uh, countries that have been asked to vote on basically integrationist EU measures, then politicians are hoodwinked and offered cushy jobs and plush retirements in Brussels 
uh, at the taxpayer's expense, second referendums take place and eventually amidst huge media pressure and establishment uh, urging, uh, the public's rolled over. And that's a pattern across the EU. And you know what, that's one reason why the popularity of the EU across the broad swathe of the European demos has fallen from roughly 60 to 70 percent Pew survey show, highly respectable um, uh, social surveys uh, that the Pew Institute in the US do, from 60 to 70 percent as recently as the early and mid 90s, down to more like 25 to 30 to 35 percent, even in the core countries. You know, the EU is not popular anymore, particularly um, among the core countries where you'd expect it to be popular, mm -hmm. like France and Germany. Yes, Macron won, but for every five people who voted for Macron, four people either uh, abstained or sport their ballot. This was not a ringing yeah. in, in, in endorsement. I like the fact that uh, in France, Brexit is extremely popular. I think 55% of French want the Britain to leave I, the I EU. Think, I think the EU is looking at Britain very, very with a great deal of interest and with a lot of sort of unspoken admiration for what we're doing amongst the general population. And this is what... If, I went if, to Greece in, mm. in, in uh, April of this year and time and time again I find myself in a bar talking to the locals and they'd all go, you, you voted to leave, you voted to leave, God, what, why? And there was total admiration yeah. for the fact that we'd done that. And I was saying to them, you need to do the same thing, otherwise you're going to be debt slaves to Germany. I actually, I actually think that if the UK rolls over and accepts a second referendum, you know, the rest of the world, we will be deeply denuded that's as a democracy. Gonna, surely that's not going to happen. Well, I wouldn't put it, Dominic, I watch Parliament very, very closely, as, as you know. Um, I think the House of Lords in particular is, is full of ultra-Remainers, uh, many of whom have been on Europe's payroll for many years in the past. Uh, the Lib Dems and the Lords are deeply determined to uh, mm. hold another referendum that, that scuppers Brexit. Look at, look at Vince Cable. Now, Vince Cable is somebody I've known and admired for, for many years. Obviously, a very respected, thoughtful politician. Um, and this time last year, when he wasn't Lib Dem leader, when Tim Farron was Lib Dem leader, L Vince Cable, and it's in, in my book with Gerard Lyons, was telling a Lib Dem fringe meeting, and it was reported at the time, that you can't just have another referendum. He called it deeply counterproductive, yeah? He said it would be insulting to the British people mm -hmm. to just say, oh, you voted the wrong way, and like children, you have to vote again. And I thought, there's a really principled bloke who's prepared to go against his ultra-Remain leader, mm -hmm. um, though clearly uh, Vince was the senior figure in the party by miles anyway. And he's now changed his stance. He's now he? completely changed his mind over the summer. Now he is the Lib Dem leader again, and the Lib Dems need to raise money, of course. Of course there's money among the big corporations who want us to be in the single market. The single market's great for those vested interests. Mm -hmm. Of course there's money for um, uh, campaigning groups. Um, and so the Lib Dems are basically making this their unique selling point that they are pushing for a second referendum. I'm deeply disappointed in Vince Cable that he's had this enormous vault fast. And the Labour have changed stance and, as and well. And Labour, of course, they will, Labour don't have a policy on Brexit. Their policy will be whatever it needs to be in order to topple the government. And that's why you had you know, really incredibly moving speeches, I found, by some Labour members in the House of Commons um, in mid-September when the uh, Brexit uh, EU withdrawal bill mm -hmm. uh, got its second reading. You had people like Kate Hoey uh, and Caroline Flint, Flint, Caroline, Caroline Flint, Flint, being heckled by their own side for saying that we have to do what the population told us to do, and if we don't do it, we're undermining democracy. And there's, you know, Kate Hoey was obviously a big Leave campaigner. Caroline Flint, who voted. Who, who campaigned relentlessly for Remain. I mean, I think she really deserves a huge uh, uh, accolade and admiration for, for standing up for mm -hmm. her own constituents who voted Leave and the country in general. But be in no doubt, if Labour and the Lib Dems think that they can get electoral advantage and par party political advantage and topple the British government and sacrifice you know, the, the decision that was made uh, in a referendum that Parliament had earlier sanctioned by a vote of six to one and has since sanctioned by voting through Article 50 in such huge numbers, 
then they will. And, and personally, that's why I'm not a politician. I find that kind of behaviour completely egregious. Would you have expected that, that second reading to go through by a bigger majority than it did? I think it was 36 votes. It, it was 36. I don't really see how you can get mu a much bigger majority than that um, when you, Labour's on a three-line whip. It was interesting that a lot of... Um, there were no Tory um, uh, rebels. Yeah. Anna Subri, Ken Clark, Nicky Morgan and so on. Remainers in the Tory party who say they accept the vote, but will the referendum election result? But um, frankly, we'll see. Um, and then there was base. There were no Tory rebels, and there was quite a you know eight or nine Labour rebels, and then another Labour members who abstained. So thirty six is probably the biggest majority this government under its confidence supply agreement is probably ever going to see in anything to do with Brexit. Uh, as the legislation goes through. And I don't rule out defeats for the government. I don't rule out a second referendum. And just imagine if we had a second referendum, Britain would look, not only the kind of uh, opprobrium of huge swathes of the population, including Remain voters, that this political elite doesn't just get on with it uh, and is playing, fiddling, you know, while well, there's many other things to do, health, education, all the rest of it, if Think, there's a second referendum, the, the credibility of our institutions well, well, is, we're, is We're both sort of pretty financially you know, literate people. That's how we got to know each other, right? Talking about markets, talking about investments, all the rest of it. Imagine what it's going to do to so like the UK's reputation as a place for stable government and political, not certainty, but political predictability. Uh, imagine what it's going to do to Britain's credit rating when we've got 90% mm. of GDP as our sovereign debt and a third of our guilts are held by the Bank of England. These politicians, they're so determined to get their own way, the, the ultra-Remainers, that they, they have no... They, they can't fathom the huge economic yeah. and political and financial forces they are playing with here. Also, you would just show the whole thing to be a sham. Oh, I think... You know, I'm not going to sit here on your fine podcast or, or any <laughs> national television channel and say, oh, there'll be riots in the streets. You know, I'm not going to say that, because that would be irresponsible. Uh, and no one be can, justified. And no, no, well, I'm not going to say that, Dominic, because no, no one can really know how that could play out. Yeah. But what I will say, without apology, and with some degree of certainty, or what I would assert, Dominic, is that for a huge swathe of the British population, they will give up on democracy. You will have lower turnout in every single election for the rest of our lives if that happens. It's not only that we had this referendum and it was a huge song and dance, and yes, you know, politics ignited perhaps like it never has pretty much in our lifetimes, right? Um, during that referendum uh, campaign, domestic politics. Uh, and yet so many of the people who voted leave are people in safe seats, Labour seats, whose vote has never really counted because they've always returned a Labour voter. That's why I feel particularly strongly about the Labour Party having stood on a manifesto just this summer of leaving the single market and the customs union, no questions asked, and then suddenly Jeremy Corbyn, a lever all his life, is prepared to completely twist and contort his own mind in order to come up with the, the, the complete horlicks that the Labour policy now is. I feel that's so damaging not just to the Labour Party, and we desperately need a credible Labour Party to have a proper politics in this country, um, but it's damaging to the credibility of the democratic process that a leader who's trading on his authenticity thinks he can, three months later after a general election, completely change his party's policy. Where? And then assert that change in Parliament under the banner of you know, being representative and democratic. Where is the integrity? Liam, we've run out of time. Um, I want to give your book an, a nice big plug, and I'm, I've got one last question mm. to ask you. I wanted to get on to a whole of, you know, what happens <laughs> after Brexit, what are the changes we should make? We'll have to come on an, another time and All do right. that. But here's the book. It's called Clean Brexit, and the authors are Liam Halligan and Gerard Lyons, and the sub title to the book is How to Make a Success of Leaving the European Union. Liam, my final question for you. <laughs> is Theresa May the person for the job to lead us through this? Um, she's in a situation where um, 
mischievous elements in the Tory party know that if they remove her, it's just going to be a nightmare. She's safer with a majority of 13 than she would be with a majority of 50, let's say. It's her fragileness that makes her secure. The Tory backbenchers won't dare to remove her. What I'd say she isn't um, immune to is a vote of no confidence. If, 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 if Labour and the Lib Dems between them in the Commons, and particularly in the Lords, look out for the Lords, Dominic. It's, it's going to be where all the action is this autumn. Uh, uh, if they can create such legislative chaos that the country has a feeling of, you know, this is completely mad, make it stop, um, then I think we're in a position where they could try and pick off some Tory rebels and ignite a vote of no confidence. I'm not ruling that out. I think it's a real shame that Theresa May had such a terrible uh, campaign. I think Brexit would have been a lot smoother if they had a, a, a bigger uh, majority. I think she's more determined than most people think, but she has to come across, not that this Brexit thing is a cross we have to, have to bear, she and her ministers have to get out there and sell why this is a good idea. And S sell the vision of Britain outside of the European Union, uh, how we can stand up for ourselves in the negotiation and get a good deal. And that ultimately is why Jerry and I wrote the book. And why it's a once in a generation opportunity. Liam Halligan, you can follow Liam at Liam Halligan on Twitter and you can read his column in the Sunday Telegraph. And of course, you can read his book. Liam, thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you for watching and we'll be back with more stuff that interests me very soon. I'm Dominic Frisby. Cheerio.